Halo has a rich and expansive storyline that's only getting longer, and we've arbitrarily decided to cram it all into five minutes, so we'd better get started. Five minutes? Oh, God. All right, here we go. 100,000 years ago, humanity spanned the Milky Way galaxy, but there was a problem. An insidious parasitic life form known as the Flood spread to so many species so rapidly it was looking like they'd soon be the only players on the board. While retreating from the Flood, humanity encountered a planet occupied by Forerunners, a species led by a dude called the Didact and his wife the Librarian. The Didact knows humanity, and he's not a fan. In fact, he finds them unworthy to receive the mantle of responsibility, which is a traditional role in the galaxy where advanced species look out for lesser ones. The Didact and Forerunners stole the mantle from an even older alien race called the Precursors by wiping them out. Hypocrites much? Anyway, there's a big war between the Forerunners and humans who are both also being assaulted by the Flood and the humans lose. The Forerunners de-evolve them and revert them back to caveman times as punishment, seeding an obscure planet called Earth with the human survivors of the war. But they still have the Flood to deal with. The Didact's plan are these fake planets called Shield Worlds and an army of warriors called Prometheans made of the consciousnesses of Forerunner warriors implanted into synthetic bodies by a device called a Composer. He gets outvoted though, and the Forerunners instead build an array of super weapons floating in space designed to wipe out all life in the galaxy at any time if need be in order to stem the tide of the Flood. These weapons are giant terraformed rings in space called Halos, collectively known as the Halo Array. The Didact goes rogue when he's ordered to dismantle the Shield World, steals the Composer, and heads to Earth, intending to compose all the remaining humans to swell the ranks of his robot army. Incidentally, being a robot makes you immune to the Flood's parasitism, so he kind of has a point on that front. The Forerunners foil the plan with the help of the Librarian, who sells out her husband, believing archival of every species in the galaxy is the way to go instead, read the Flood. The Didact is imprisoned on one of his own shield worlds called Requiem, along with his loyal Prometheans. Not sure why you'd bury Hitler with an army of loyal Nazi soldiers right next to him should he ever awaken, but okay. Meanwhile, the Flood continues to evolve and grow more intelligent, and the Forerunners build an AI named Mendicant Bias to help strategize against them. MB immediately decides to test the Halo Array by wiping out all life on one random planet, Alderaan style, which doesn't bode well. Indeed, a Flood Flood grave mind, which are the things that represent the combined consciousnesses of millions of Flood, reaches out telepathically or technopathically to Mendicant and convinces it to turn evil. That means the Forerunners are up against the Flood and their own AI war machine, which renders the war essentially hopeless. As a last ditch effort, the Forerunners build Installation 00, aka the Lesser Ark, which both stores the DNA of a bunch of species and pumps out new halos. It sits just outside the galaxy, so that even if the halo array is fired and the Flood finally ended, the life stored there will survive. You know, like Noah's Ark, although how Forerunners named their thing after something from our Bible long before the Bible was ever written, I don't know, but okay. The Ark constructs seven halos, dubbed the Final Array. The Forerunners trigger it, etch a sketching the galaxy clean of life, then teleport clones of each species back to suitable planets to begin again. Humanity's portal opens on Africa, and Halo's history finally starts to match up with the actual history of humans on Earth. This is us. This is the line of humans we come from. Okay, so, 2,500 years later, humanity has once again become a spacefaring species, not knowing that this is like the second or third time they've done that. While the Forerunner civilization lies forgotten and in almost complete ruin. Humanity, thinking itself alone in the galaxy, has its own problems. Colonies on the outer edges of human space feel oppressed by the older core worlds, and a civil war is well underway. Dr. Catherine Halsey of the UNSC forms the Spartan II Project, a military operation that kidnapped a bunch of kids, replaced them with clones IRL so their parents wouldn't miss them, then subjected them to brutal experiments to turn them into hulking super soldiers. Originally intended to crush the rebels slash fight terrorism depending on how you view things, the Spartans later became much more important once we made First Contact, and this time First Contact would be with a race comprised of many races all bundled together into a galactic army with nefarious goals and plenty of weaponry. This union of evil aliens calls itself the Covenant, and it's the Covenant invasion of a world called Harvest that sets all the events of the Halo series in motion. That that's right. We just got to the content of one of the Halo games, specifically Halo Wars 1. This was all prologue, and I said it as fast as I could, and we're four minutes in. F this is so f Okay, pushing forward. Halo Wars. So Covenant ships come and use plasma cannons to kill everything on Harvest and melt the soil into glass. It sucks. It turns out they targeted that particular planet because they lust for powerful Forerunner technology and artifacts, and a particularly juicy one lies buried on Harvest. It's a map, leading to the locations of dozens of other also powerful Forerunner artifacts. The Covenant starts sweeping through the galaxy seeking these, wiping out any humans who happen to be on planets that they want to dig up. One human ship, the Spirit of Fire, under the command of Captain James Cutter, follows the Covenant 
fleet to a world called Acadia. While investigating Forerunner architecture there, Professor Ellen Anders is kidnapped by the Covenant and forced to activate a Forerunner Dreadnought. That's because Forerunner tech, which they swiped from the Precursors, is designed so that humans can activate it, but Covenant can't, since humans were the ones the Precursors had intended to take over the mantle of responsibility. That's why you'll often hear humans referred to as Reclaimers in the series. They're the ones who are supposed to reclaim the mantle. The Spirit of Fire shows up, Anders escapes, and there's a showdown on a shield world. The humans discover Flood infesting the world, so they detonate their own slip space drive to destroy the planet. This decimates the Covenant and prevents them from activating the shield world, which would have wiped out humanity. But without their hyperdrive, the SOF will take thousands of years to get back to friendly space, so the crew all freeze themselves and are considered lost in action. Most of humanity remains unaware of the Flood until a little later during the events of Halo Reach. In that one, the Galactic Civil War has advanced a pace, and now there's a Spartan 3 program. 3s are smaller knockoffs of Spartan 2s and aren't created by kidnapping kids. Noise. A squad comprised of some 3s and a 2 called Noble Team are sent to the planet Reach in 2552 to stop what they think is an insurrectionist plot, but which turns out to be yet another covenant invasion of human worlds. Noble Team rescues Dr. Halsey, mother of the Spartan program, and fight to defend the planet, but soon realize the cause is lost. Halsey sends them to the ship Pillar of Autumn along with a fragment of an advanced AI named Cortana. One of the Spartan 3s, June, escorts Cortana and the Doctor safely off planet while the rest of Noble Team dies in action. Sad. Halo Combat Evolved was the first Halo game ever released, and its story falls neatly into this spot right Chia. Fleeing the Covenant on Reach, the Pillar of Autumn makes a blind slip space jump and winds up near one of the Halo rings, known as Installation 04. Captain Key decides to activate a legendary Spartan 2 by the name of John 117, or Master Chief. Master Chief is ordered to protect the Cortana AI and flees from the Covenant as the Pillar of Autumn crash lands, ending up on the terraformed surface of the Halo ring world. Cortana leads John to the Halo's control room, where he uses the consoles there to try and locate Captain Key. Instead, he runs into the Flood, who have taken over most of the POA's crew. The Flood were held in captivity aboard the Halo, but the Covenant unleashed them by poking around. See, a bunch of the Covenant think that the Halos are religious artifacts and that they can transcend to paradise by activating them. Cortana and Master Chief then run into 343 Guilty Spark, a little sentient floating robot thingy that monitors the Halo installation. 343 tells them that the only way to wipe out the Flood on the Halo is to activate it, and helps them recover the activation index they need to do so. Right before pulling the ripcord on the Halo, Cortana discovers its true power, however, specifically that it'll wipe out all life in a 25,000 light year radius that's a big radius. Cortana sends Chief to detonate the Pillar of Autumn's fusion reactor instead, much to Guilty Spark's chagrin. The Chief finds Captain Key, who's been absorbed by the Flood and is midway through being turned into a grave mine, rips out his neural implant, and uses it to blow up the drive. As the halo disintegrates like some donut Death Star, Master Chief and Cortana fly into the sunset. Or space set. Whatever. In Halo 2, Master Chief's well-deserved medal ceremony aboard a near-Earth space station is interrupted by Covenant forces, who appear out of slip space and seem to be surprised to find humans occupying Earth. John 117 helps lead a counter-assault, ultimately forcing the Covenant flagship led by the Prophet of Regret, a Covenant hierarch, to flee by going into slip space right on top of the city of New Mombasa, leveling it. Aboard a ship called the In Amber Clad, and under the command of Captain Key's daughter Miranda Keys, Master Chief and crew chase after finding themselves popping out right next to another halo. It turns out the Prophet of Regret intends to activate the ring to wipe humans off of Earth, so Master Chief fights his way onto the halo to the Prophet and punches him to death. Bet he's got one more regret now. Just then, a flying coven in capital city called High Charity appears and starts to blast the halo with plasma cannons. On board the city ship, a whole other storyline is playing out. See, when a member of the Covenant is disgraced, they are sometimes given the title of Arbiter and sent on important suicide missions to redeem themselves. Think of them as the Covenant and Spartans. The Arbiter we care about, called the Arbiter, accepts his new title and is sent to wipe out the Heretics, a Covenant splinter group that broke off when they discovered the truth about the Halo Rings, namely that they aren't portals to heaven, but rather death loops of destruction. The Arbiter, who does believe in the religious nature of the Halos, at least for now, runs into Guilty Spark while defeating the Heretics. 343GS to the Arbiter is a great oracle and seer of religious truths. Just as 343 is about to disabuse the Arbiter of this notion, a Covenant brute commander appears and 
captures the little bot. That wraps up that mission, so the Arbiter returns to High Charity, only to find that the political climate has changed dramatically since the Prophet of Regret got punched to death. The Sangheili, the Covenant race of which the Arbiter is one, have been dethroned as the official guards of the Hierarch class and have been replaced by brutes of the same sort that captured 343. The Arbiter stays on as Arbiter, however, and is sent on a new mission, recovering the activation index for this latest Halo ring. He heads to the library where the key resides and captures Captain Keys to boot. That's two captured keys for those keeping track at home. Before the Arbiter can take possession, he gets ambushed by the same brute from before named Tartarus, who has in fact been ordered by the Hierarch to take him out and complete the dethronement of the Sangheili. Tartarus tosses the Arbiter into a hell pit, which in Greek mythology is also called a Tartarus, which is confusing, and he's caught by a full-grown flood grave mind. At this point, the Arbiter's story intersects with Master Chief, since Chief has also been captured by the same grave mind. The flood convinces Master Chief and the Arbiter to work together, since all three of them want to keep the Covenant from activating the Halo. The grave mind teleports our bad boys right to the Halo control room, where Tartarus is about to use the Index and Captain Key to activate the ring. The Arbiter kills Tartarus, and they stop the Halo from firing, at least this time. But what's that? Unintended consequences? 343 Guilty Spark explains that aborting the firing triggered a system standby mode that allows all the rings in the Halo array to be fired remotely should they need to be from Installation 00, the Lesser Arc. That means even though this Halo isn't going to fire right now, the cosmic football has been fumbled and is live, and if the Covenant can leap onto the Ark before humanity does, they can really burn the galaxy down in a hurry. In the midst of all this madness, Master Chief also infiltrates High Charity, discovers a plot by the Prophet of Truth to attack Earth yet again, and makes the tough decision to give chase and save the world, even though it means leaving the Halo and putting the whole galaxy at risk. He leaves Cortana behind with explicit orders to detonate the in amber clad, since that's the only way we seem to have figured out to blow up a Halo. He uses a fancy gravity catapult to shoot himself toward the Forerunner Dreadnought the Covenant have been using as their flagship, and plans to commandeer it back to Earth. Meanwhile, the High Charity itself has been evacuated by the Covenant and completely taken over by the Flood Gravemind, who keeps Cortana captive in the systems of the ship. <sighs> Okay, Halo 3, woof. So, Master Chief plummets into Earth's atmosphere, yeah? And he gets found by the Arbiter and Sergeant Johnson, his pals from Halo 2, right? Well, they find out that the Prophet of Truth returned to Earth in order to find a portal to the Lesser Ark that the Forerunners placed under New Mombasa. He plans to go through it and activate the entire Halo array at once, which it turns out is why the Covenant came to Earth in the first place. A battle ensues, but the Prophet and some of his forces are able to slip through the portal, just as a flood-infested ship crash lands with a message from Cortana urging Master Chief to head to the Ark post-haste. The UN NSC Fleet, plus 343 Guilty Spark, who has nothing better to do, all head through the slip space portal and arrive at Installation 00 with the Flood hot on their heels and in pursuit of the Covenant. The Flood, arriving aboard High Charity, quickly infests the Ark, which is good because otherwise you wouldn't have had as much stuff to shoot at during the game. The Prophet of Truth captures Johnson and uses him as a human key, activating the Halo Array. But before it can fire, the Chief and Arbor strike yet another uneasy truce with the Flood, fight their way to the Prophet of Truth, and choke him to death. Mixing it up. Choking. It's the new punching. Master Master Chief deactivates the array, saving the galaxy, and the Flood immediately turn on him because in case you forgot, they're f***ing evil. 343 Master Chief and the Arbiter all escape and discover the nature of the Ark on their way out the door. Realizing that the Ark generates halos and that it's currently in the middle of producing a new halo to replace the one destroyed at the end of Halo Combat Evolved, they form a new plan to activate the halo while it's still way out here, near the Ark but away from the rest of the galaxy. This would kill all the Flood aboard the Ark but leave the galaxy unscathed. Solid plan. They save Cortana from High Charity, blowing it up and killing the Grave Mind. Everyone evacuates the Ark except Master Chief Johnson, the Arbiter, Cortana, and 343. Guilty Spark wants them to wait until the Halo is complete before firing it, fearing it will shake apart and destroy itself if triggered too early. But Guilty Spartan Master Chief has different ideas, wanting to fire ASAP since the Flood Grave Mind is already beginning to rebuild itself. 343 kills Sergeant Johnson for trying to activate the Halo early, Chief flips out and blows up 343's current shell, and activates the ring. As predicted, the ring wipes out the Flood, but also shakes itself apart, forcing Chief to dramatically flee to the ship forward unto dawn. As the FUD disappears through a slipstream portal, the portal closes, cutting the ship in half with the Arbiter back in Earth space and the Chief and Cortana adrift in uncharted waters. The Chief puts himself into cryosleep and awaits rescue. Two years later, Halo 4 kicks off with Dr. Halsey being tried for her crimes. Remember, she kidnapped those children and made them super soldiers? Well, Cortana finally awakens the Chief because their ship has been boarded 
it by Covenant. John and Cortana soon discover that the forward unto dawn has drifted into Covenant's space near the Shield World Requiem where the Didact has been imprisoned this whole time. A Covenant faction calling themselves the Remnants are attempting to awaken him. Upon scanning Chief and realizing he's a human reclaimer and therefore capable of making the tech work, the Shield World automatically opens a big hole in its surface and sucks everyone in, destroying the forward unto dawn. John 117 awakens on the inside surface of the inside out planet. It's like a halo, but rounder. To make matters worse, Cortana starts acting weird and explains that AIs undergo an aging process called rampancy. They don't age and die, but they eventually become corrupted and essentially go crazy, which is begun in her case. Ouch. To save Cortana, Chief is dead set on getting out of the shield world and back to Dr. Halsey, who he believes can help. Chief fights his way through the remnants and the Didax leftover Prometheans, finally reaching the cartographer, a mapping system that reveals there's another UNSC ship nearby, the Infinity. It flew through the hole in the shield world and seems like their ticket out of here. Cortana and Chief attempt to warn the Infinity of the dangers, but can't make contact, and instead encounter a strange hovering metal object when they physically track down the signal they thought was the ship. Turns out, it's the Didax jail cell, which then opens, releasing the ancient asshole and giving Halo 4 its main antagonist. The Didact quickly overpowers Master Chief and declares the return of Forerunner primacy in the galaxy. We'll see how that works out. After some more laser fights, Chief makes his way through Covenant and Promethean alike to arrive at the real Infinity, where he meets a Spartan 4 called Palmer and the ship's commanding officer, Captain Del Rio. The new game plan is to destroy the gravity well at the heart of the shield world, allowing the Infinity to jump away. Just then, John has a vision of the librarian the Didact's wife who betrayed him back in the day when he first went power mad. She explains the whole history of the Forerunners from the beginning of this video. That is, chronologically, this is when the player learned all the stuff about the Forerunners. Neat! The librarian explains that now that he's awake, the Didact's plan will certainly be to grow the ranks of the Prometheans by using a composer to trap the souls of all the humans in the galaxy. You know, that classic jam. She also does some wooshy magic that makes Master Chief immune to being composed. Double neat! Captain Del Rio notices that Cortana's showing signs of rampancy and orders her handed over for reformatting or whatever, which the Chief doesn't cotton to. Instead, he steals Cortana and a pelican ship and goes rogue on a quest to slay the Didact. He follows the Didact ship through a portal to Ivanov Station, where a composer resides. The Didact immediately uses said composer to turn the whole crew of the station into ashes, then speeds toward Earth, planning to burn us or make us into evil robots, with Master Chief hot on his trail. The Didact composes the entire population of New Phoenix, which is a city, before rapidly going rampant Cortana helps Master Chief fight his way to the Didact's inner sanctum, where he dispatches the Didact with a well-placed forerunner pulse grenade. The Chief then manually detonates a nuke to destroy the composer, and Cortana teleports him away from the blast and into near-Earth space where he gets picked up by the Infinity. Sadly, Tinkerbell, I mean Cortana, also bids her old friend goodbye and fades away to parts unknown. Ultimately, the UNSC blames the Covenant Remnant faction for New Phoenix, rather than the Didact, who seems to vanish. After a long time apart, Master Chief is finally reunited with his original squad, Blue Team, and they're sent on a mission to discover the origins of the Composer, since it's such a threat. They ultimately discover the Composer's Forge, an installation that makes Composers much like the Ark makes Halos. And guess who's there, turning the crank and pumping out Composers? That's right, our old disavowed pal, the Didact. Chief kills him again, for real this time, and Blue Team destroy all the Composers and the Forge. But forget Halo 4. Halo 4 is gone now. Halo 5 Guardians starts in the year 2558, and Covenant attacks have only gotten worse since the Prometheans have rejoined the fight. A team of shiny new Spartan 4s, Fire Team Osiris, are sent to kill Jewel Madama, leader of a Covenant splinter group that have occupied a planet called Kamchatka, and host Dr. Halsey, who fled to avoid the outcome of her trial from the last game. They take back the planet, kill Jewel, and recapture Halsey, who warns of a much graver threat on the horizon and tries to leverage that intel to make a deal. While on the mission, Osiris also witnessed something disturbing, Covenant seemingly losing control of their Promethean Forerunner foot soldiers. At the same time, Blue Team and Master Chief are off fighting Covenant in another part of space when John 117 suddenly receives a cryptic mental message from Cortana, Meridian is next. So, once again against orders and doing what his rampant AI girlfriend tells him to, Master Chief goes rogue, this time taking Blue Team with him, and they all head to the planet Meridian. 
Guardian. Fireteam Osiris, armed with immobilization devices, are sent after them. This leads to a confrontation in which Chief fist fights Locke, the leader of Osiris, and flips it on him, immobilizing him with one of his own immobilizers. Blue Team presses on. Ultimately, they discover the existence of yet another killer forerunner tech, Guardians, giant neon Evangelion-looking angel robots designed to fly around policing the galaxy with their super weapons. The first Guardian emerges on Genesis, a planet with a connection to the Domain, which is the mysterious plane from which Cortana is operating. She claims that the Forerunners have cured her rampancy, but that's arguable because the new plan is to take control of the Guardians herself. See, she thinks she'll do a better job of guarding humanity than, well, humanity. Classic I Cortana move. Fireteam Osiris travel to Sanghelios, a Covenant homeworld, and help the Arbiter put down remnant forces there in exchange for his help catching up to Blue Team. To do so, they hitch a ride aboard a Guardian, which carries them to the staging area on Genesis. Once there, Osiris encounter another Forerunner monitor, O31 Exuberant Witness, who's in the process of being remolded and just generally pushed around by Cortana. Not happy about that, O31 aids Osiris in reaching Blue Team, hoping they'll eventually kick Cortana out of Exuberant Witness's systems. The teams meet again, and Locke explains that Cortana is attempting to usurp the mantle of responsibility for herself. The Chief tries to talk her down, but she refuses, immobilizes Blue Team, and attempts to kidnap them. Fireteam Osiris recover Blue Team and return control of Genesis to Exuberant Witness, forcing Cortana to flee aboard another Guardian. AI across the galaxy suddenly start to pledge their allegiance to Cortana, but one AI, the control AI aboard the ship Infinity, named Roland, remains loyal and makes an emergency slip space jump in order to escape her widening sphere of influence. Because it's not a Halo game if it doesn't end with an emergency slip space jump that sets up the next game. This game ends with Blue Team and Fire Team Osiris meeting up again on Sanghelios, along with the Arbiter, Palmer the Spartan 4, and everyone's favorite walking moral gray area, Dr. Catherine Halsey. Technically speaking, the events of Halo Wars 2 come a little later in 2859. After 28 years drifting in space, the Spirit of Fire, remember the original ship with Captain Cutter and Alan Anders aboard, finally awakens. Upon doing so, they realize they've been forcibly transported to right near the Lesser Ark, old Installation Double Zero. An aggressive Covenant faction called the Banished have occupied the Ark, and SOF forces begin a surface campaign against them while simultaneously trying to find a way to contact the UNSC. They finally realize that the Ark is currently mid-build on a replacement Halo. The new ring, called Installation 09, will inevitably teleport back to known space once it's complete, so the humans decide to hitch a ride when the time comes. In order to do so, they make their way to the control room aboard Halo 9 and disarm its weapon systems right before it jumps. Anders is left behind and some of the Spirit of Fire's crew, but most are able to evacuate onto the ring in time. Unfortunately, rather than completing their ride back home, the ring is yanked out of slip space mid-jump by a Guardian. And that is the Halo story so far. <sighs> As for the upcoming Halo Infinite, assuming it carries the same story forward, we've got to assume that pesky Guardian is under Cortana's control, and that Master Chief's attempts to cure her rampancy and prevent her from stealing the mantle will make up the main thrust of Infinite's story. That said, there are bound to be plenty of surprises along the way, and now you're properly primed for each and every one. Good hunting, Chief. Party on! Dude Summer is here, and with it, the biggest show in entertainment, Comic-Con. And this year, it's on IGN. Starting July 22nd, IGN is giving you a front row seat to the geekiest celebrity panels. I love this show! <laughs> the coolest merch, the latest trailers, and the biggest reveals from across the world of movies, TV, and comics. Whoa. Catch all five days of Comic-Con at home on IGN and IGN1 on Samsung TV+.